Hi guys, thanks so much for having me. I'm Alex Albright. I was just reminded why dresses sometimes can be difficult if you don't have pockets with you. So I'm just gonna hold this. I saw some ladies smile in there, so. Anyway, um, so I'm presenting some work uh, that I started at Williams College with my co-author, Peter Padroni, right over there. Um, I'm currently moving from the west coast to the east coast right now, so I'm going farther away from Napa and Sonoma, but good news, I'll be closer to Bordeaux now, so quicker flights in the future. Um, so just to start off, the big, is this not the button? No, this is only the microphone. Oh. <laughs> How have people been moving this? They've been coming over here? Okay. And yeah, there's that clicky thing. While you're walking around. Does that work? Okay. Oh my gosh, yeah, now I, now I need all this stuff. Maybe I can clip this to my watch. Okay, this is gonna work now. Okay, great. So the overarching goal of our work here is that we're trying a new approach to evaluate uh, and understand expert impact on price by exploiting a form of social media data. And we're using wine as a very fitting case study to do this. And when I say a new approach, I'm obviously implying that there's some kind of old approach to this or something that's pretty traditional. And that's something that we see a lot at um, these conferences and a lot of papers. And that's kind of implying that the expert review is entirely attributed to his or her reputation. So the idea that the expert review is actually driving price and that it's not actually just reflecting some underlying quality, because how would we get to that underlying quality? That's a big question. So we're trying to come up with some way to actually potentially identify that underlying quality. And the reason why wine is such a perfect example to look at this kind of thing is because wine has a bunch of features that make it really attractive for this sort of structural analysis. So just to name a few, wine is a very interesting signal extraction problem. We assume that quality changes over time. There's a dumb phase, goes up, goes down at certain points, so people are trying to figure out quality at certain moments. Also, once wine has been produced and released, its quality is exogenous to reviews, so unlike if I go to a restaurant and write about the soup that was too salty, they can change that. If I write about the wine, the wine isn't now looking at itself and saying, what should I change about myself? It doesn't care. So that's another great thing. The last two points I'd like to make are about uh, data sets that are available for wine. So we know that there's a strong reviewer presence in wine in the form of Robert Parker and others. Just think about the cartoon book that we saw yesterday that's in French. We can't debate that obviously he has a pretty big presence. Um, the other point is about this thing called Seller Tracker which is a online community full of uniquely informed and um, lots of very informed consumers who make ratings about wines all the time. So just a few notes on this in case you're not familiar. Has a few hundred thousand users tracking tens of millions of bottles of wine. There's over five million tasting notes. Tasting notes being these reviews. There's a numerical component and a textual component to all of those just like there would be for a Parker rating online. And we're basically now in this project collecting, and we have collected, seller tracker data as well as Robert Parker data, as well as auction prices and retail prices. So a lot of people have been talking about on premier prices. Good to note also that we're using a different form of prices. And we're also focusing on revisionary reviews of Robert Parker rather than the original reviews. And we can talk about that later if people have questions. So um, the big point that we should probably get to now is if we do care about quality, then we need to define this since we're doing some sort of structural analysis. And quality is something that comes up all the time in these presentations, and it can differ person to person what we want it to be in our models and our discussions. So just to quickly get into that, quality for us is not just people's opinions or personal preferences. It's actually components of the wine, features of the wine that maybe some people like and some people don't like, so concentration of fruit, tannins, acidity, all this stuff. And as I mentioned before, we're assuming that quality can change over time. And we're also saying that, hey, quality characteristics could change person to person in terms of whether they like them or not, and it could also depend on what kind of wine they're evaluating. So it's not totally blind to where it's from, for example. So while quality we're defining as being something that's inside the bottle for wine. There's also all of this stuff happening outside the bottle, no doubt. 
And so name, label, also these expert reviews, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. And consumers ascribe a big social value to those. It's nice to be able to brag about your 98 point Robert Parker wine, so that's obviously important for price. And so how are we gonna distinguish between potentially quality stuff going on inside the bottle and everything else? Well, we're basically gonna say that there's a difference between the public and the seller tracker community in that both are conducting signal extraction problems in order to make decisions about price, but seller tracker users are also making a decision about scores after and are thus learning and filtering in a way that they don't for price decisions. So this is an assumption about behavior and uh, yeah, rating behaviors. And we're gonna exploit this difference for the purpose of identification. Using a model developed in Padroni 2013, Padroni is my co-author, so this is exciting. Um, and basically this method uh, is used to identify unobserved shocks in heterogeneous panels via a VAR method, and there's a few other points, but I'm gonna skip them for time. And basically our unobservable shocks in this case are gonna be quality information shocks and other shocks. The bivariate VAR process that we use basically is two equation, two variable model where our two variables are log seller tracker scores and then log auction prices. There's also the retail price case, but I'm just gonna talk about this one for time. And each variable is explained by its own lagged variables as well as current and past values of other ones. So now getting back to what you have to do to actually run something like this, you have to have an identifying restriction. You have to have a restriction in something we call the impact matrix. So our identifying restriction is that other shocks have no immediate direct impact on seller tracker quality assessment. They can have an indirect impact over time since they impact price and then seller tracker reviews might be conditional on that, but this is the important restriction that we hold. So now that we've been talking about quality information shocks and other shocks, you might be saying, what happened to Parker and all of this? And don't worry, he's coming back right now. Um, basically what we're gonna do is Parker is a shock to system and we're gonna decompose this shock up as we could any other into a quality information and another shock. And as many people agree, reviewer, um, reviewers often serve two purposes, which is to pass information along to people and then also to disseminate that information. So this was mentioned briefly by um, Professor Ashenfelter yesterday. And then our results that we're gonna get are impulse responses, which describe the in, a reaction of endogenous variables at the time of shocks and then for the periods after. So since everything's in logs, what I'm gonna show you next are percent responses. Um, also, you get a different impulse response for each line. So I'm gonna show you something with a line and then two lines around it, but it's not a confidence interval. I know, I always, when I see that too, I, opposite, I immediately think 95% confidence interval, but we're talking uh, quantiles here, so. Just FYI. So the first set of graphs that we're gonna look at is um, without looking at Parker at all. So right now we just have our um, quality information shocks, other shocks. The big thing to note is that um, up on the top right graph, first quarter, seller tracker is restricted at zero, which is our impact, it was the impact restriction that I had discussed. And you can see, as you'd expect, that positive um, there's a positive response from seller tracker and from price to quality information shocks, but what's really notable is that the response to auction prices of other is actually way higher around 8% rather than on the other hand you had 0.4%, which is much lower. So that potentially serves as early evidence of um, the publicity channel being more important. Now we're gonna look at the composite Parker shocks and uh, responses to those. So this is not breaking up Parker yet. This is pretty much basic. Um, no restrictions to this, just looking at um, effects as if it was an event analysis. And you can see immediately that seller tracker is pretty much lingering around zero for the median. Meanwhile, price is up around uh, 0.6, which still isn't, which isn't very high, but now we're curious about how that would decompose if we were to define our Parker shocks in the way I described before. And what you end up seeing is that pretty much all of what we just saw on the previous slide in terms of price is now concentrated on the publicity shock side, um, which is again further evidence as to a potential strength in the publicity channel for the expert instead of it being through some kind of quality information. The other thing to note 
that we think is really interesting is that seller tracker scores are responding in a very heterogeneous way to um, across different wines relative to Parker. So what I mean by that is about, if the median is near zero, we actually have about 50% above, 50% below. And basically what we think that could mean is that you actually have maybe components of wines as we had defined them in the uh, quality definition, evaluated differently maybe due to something like geographic context. So we have Bordeaux and California wines in our sample. So it could be that Parker, fav Parker favored components like blackberry or chocolate or things that people often point out as being um, signs of Parkerization could maybe be evaluated better in one context where they're seen as more natural as opposed to another context where they're seen as um, an after effect of people trying to make their wines for Parker. So that's a potential story that we were thinking about. And in terms of future work, we find that one um, point really important to talk more about. And there is a lot more to be done in terms of potentially scraping the textual components of the reviews instead of just scraping the numerical components. So um, I think that had been talked about yesterday also um, as an option. And if you were to have the textual components, then you could break these ideas down actually into your terminology and what exactly we're talking about when we're talking about these components. So that's a nice um, potential direction for this, especially when we're thinking about re research that's comparing judgment aggregation in crowds to uh, the opinions of experts. And I think that that kind of stuff will become more and more popular as things like Seller Tracker and other online systems become more available to people as data sources. So that's it.